All right, let's get to work. I wonder where these chords come from. This whole lecture is about the 2-5-1 progression. Well, where does the 2 chord come from? Where does the 5 chord come from? Where does the 1 chord come from? To be honest with you, they all come from the major scale. There's no exceptions. It's all an, in an incredible diatonic experience. They're just from that major scale. Let's prove it. Take a peek at the attachment that I have as a part of this lecture. Uh, interestingly, it's called uh, deriving and identifying the two, five, and the one chord. <laughs> but if you print that or if you have that up on your tablet so that you can refer to it, you'll find that the top line is simply the C major scale. Just this. Not a big deal. If you want to play it the way piano players play it, it's one, two, three, or thumb, index, finger, middle finger, and then cross under like this. Cross under here. And on the way down, cross over with your middle finger right here. Under. And over with your middle finger. Second line of, uh, the sec not the second line of music, but the second line on that worksheet uh, simply creates triads on each of those scale degrees. But this is where it gets interesting, and this is where we should talk. You and I have this discussion about which ones are major and which ones are minor. And identify those using some Roman numeral analysis. And ideally, capital Roman numeral means major, lowercase Roman numeral means minor. You'll see on my on the sheet that I've provided you, um, there's a bit of an idiosyncrasy when it comes to this jazz font that I'm using, and it's not very conspicuous as to which ones are capitals and which ones are lower cases. Um, so you'll see that I've chosen just briefly for the two chord uh, a different font so that you can more conspicuously see the like the two little eyes with the, the dot on top of it meaning minor. Here's the second line. You can try it using any fingers you want. I'm using one, two, and four. You could easily use one, three, and five, whatever, whatever, whatever is comfortable for you. Now, let's take our time and let's listen and let's identify. It's a 50-50 it's a chance, but I, I'll bet it the it chances are better for you. Which one's major, which one's minor? Which one's major, which one's minor? Here's the first one. Major. Next one. Minor. The next one. Minor. The next one. Major. The next one. Major. The next one. Minor. The last one. I'm sorry to be a scoundrel. This is neither major nor minor. It's close to minor. This is kind of a super minor chord. They, this is called a diminished chord, and you'll see the analysis has a little exponent, a little small zero, like a little degree sign meaning diminished. We'll forego talking about that for the purposes of this video. If you or if you don't process by hearing, or if you only in part process by hearing, or if you can't hear the distinction between major and minor, I have a, an assist uh, for that, a point of reference for that, and that is simply counting intervals. If we're looking to, to create a major triad, all I have to do is count four half steps from the root to the third. If I want to create a minor triad, I count three half steps. Let's do it together. We said this is major. All right, let's count half steps from the root. One, two, three, four. Four half steps means a major triad. Ah, major. I'm zipping up to four. There's four. One, two, three, four half steps. So the four chord is also major. Five. One, two, three, four. Five is also a major triad. So C, in this case, C, F, N, G, one, four, and five are all major. Point of reference should sound similar to sound similar to 1, 4, and 5. All right.
right, let's do the others, two, three, and six. And again, we're gonna forego talking about the seven chord, the diminished chord for the purposes of this lecture. Two, counting from the root, one, two, three, three half steps. It will always produce a minor chord. Three, one, two, three half steps. E is also minor. Those three chords, two, three, and six, are minor. Should sound like this. Should sound like this. Okay, in summary, if we look at that second line on the worksheet, you and I find that the one chord is major, the two chord is minor, and the five chord is major. That's enough for that second line and enough to give us a basis for this lecture. To really seal the deal, I'm going to the third line on the worksheet, and this is the creation of seventh chords. I create them the same way. Instead of using three tones, I'm using four tones. The, again, the fingering doesn't much matter. Uh, you could try one, two, four, five, whatever, whatever's, whatever's comfortable for your hand is fine. Remember, the triad, the, the, the major part of the chord, I shouldn't say major part of the chord, the, 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 the main part of the chord, the part that we mentioned in the second line of music, is going to be the same. Major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, diminished, one, right? This is gonna be the same. All I'm doing, this is additive. I'm adding a note on the top. And so let's look at this uh, last note, this seventh. Here's the root, one, two, three. Here's the third, four, five. Here's the fifth, six, seven. Here's the seventh. But I want to show you a bit of a trick, a little bit of a hint. Instead of counting it from the base or counting from, uh, uh, from the beginning, numerically speaking, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, let's start at eight and go backwards. That's easy, it's so easy. If we have a C here, and I go to the other C, this is what we call an octave, or eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight pitches. If I, if I knock that down one half step, that's seven, isn't it? So that first chord is C major, and I'm using a major seven. C major seven is the name of this chord. You'll see that in the analysis, one major seven. In some circles, people who are talking analysis and theory and sort of, you know, uh, 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 highbrow harmony classes and things of that nature, some people call, especially in classical circles, people call this a major, major seven chord, major, major chord, or major, major seven chord. It's a major triad with a major seven. It's very logical. Let's go to the next chord in the discussion of this lecture. This is the two chord. We've already determined it's minor, but let's look at the seventh. Here's eight. If I go down a half step, that's this, isn't it? So it's interesting, in this case, I'm actually going down a whole step. So let's go back here. This is D to D. There's eight. If I go down a half step, there's seven. If I go down another half step, that's flat seven. So in, a, in this case, D minor seven, it's got the root, we've got a, a lowered third or a minor third, and a fifth. We hear that minor chord. And when we add the seven, it's a lowered seven, it's a flat seven. Again, back in those uh, circles that might be dealing with analysis or you know, harmony class or you're in a music theory class or something to that effect, uh, you might hear this referred to as a minor, minor seven chord. A minor, minor seven chord. It's a minor triad with a minor seven. Eight, major seven, minor seven, eight, seven, flat seven. However you want to determine that. Let's zip up to five and we'll button this guy up. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five is a different animal altogether. This is a major triad. We already determined that. If I do this trick again, here's eight, here's seven. Interesting. Eight, seven, and a lowered seven. Wow. Eight, major seven, flat seven. Eight, the major seven, 
and then the flatted or lowered seventh. So this is a major triad with a lowered seventh. This is referred to as a dominant chord, a dominant chord. Again, in those circles that use sort of the <laughs> double verbiage there, this is a major minor seven chord. Most people just refer to it as a dominant seven chord. In summary, here it is. We have three chords. Major seven is one. The two chord is a minor seven. The five chord is a dominant seven. And this will be true for all keys, all 12 of the keys. One is major, two is minor seven, and five is a dominant seven. More to come. All right, so just a tiny bit more theory and a tiny bit more analysis, and then we're gonna get to playing. The first point I want to make here is that if we combine the one, the two, and the five, even if we combine just the two and the five, it helps us to identify a key. This seems like such a simple observation, but it's a very powerful tool. Watch this. Here's the two chord, as we've sort of already extrapolated that from that first part of the lecture. Here's that two chord. I'm gonna hold that down with my left hand. Here's the five chord. Wow, amazing. If I can hold all those down. And then I'll also try to play the one chord. And so as you can clearly see, if I combine all of those, the one, the two, and the five, the culmination of which is the major scale. So here's something that's really powerful for me as a musician, as an improviser, as a per person who loves to improvise. And this goes for anybody who loves to improvise, whether it be in rock or in metal or in soul or jazz or classical for that matter. And that is, if we can understand what key we are in, that's very, very powerful and can inform us as to which notes to choose, at least initially, to create improvisation. So that's, a, that's the first point that I want to make, is that the 2-5 helps us to identify a key. Okay. Secondly, um, I want to uh, invite you to analyze the attachment. And the attachment, I've created this song called Tommy's two five two step and so i must apologize it's a little corny the name's a bit corny and even the melody is a bit corny but it's comprised entirely of two five and one in the key of c major there's no ifs ands or buts about it the order changes a little bit and the duration changes a little bit but it's all the two chord the five chord and the one chord and it's really to get the point across of how this is very usable just in this one key so if you print there are three versions, two of which are, you know, what is labeled as a lead sheet. And if you look at those, it's just one single line of music with a chord over it. And the other one is in a grand staff. So if you're a classical musician, this might be, um, or more traditional, prefer to see more traditional music, this may be more familiar to you with a G clef and an F clef. So you'll see two staves um, with the chord there as well. On one of the lead sheets, I've started just the analysis at the very beginning. So if you look at that, you'll see a bracket from the D minor seven to the G seven, a bracket, a little thing like this. And that pairing brings together the two and the five. It says, here's that partnership. That's the basis of this lecture. It's really exciting. I learned this from the folks at Berkeley College of Music back in the 80s. And I'll bet they still teach it this way. I think it's a very, wonderful thing to do. Bracket the two chord and the five chord together. It shows the partnership. And furthermore, to really show whether the five chord resolves down to one, resolves to the mama, goes back home, goes to one, I encourage you, as Berkeley taught me back in the 80s, to do a solid arrow, like a little rainbow, an arrow that says, I'm leaving this dominant chord and it's taking me home to the one chord. This may seem simple, but there's a couple of things that I want to mention. One is that in the real world, a lot of songs are comprised of two fives, but they don't just stay in one key. They tend to flit and fly all over and use different keys. Secondly, 
we will find that the 2-5 can exist on its own without resolution. That's why I feel like this arrow is really an important thing to do at this juncture to remind us, gosh, there's that partnership, the 2-5. I've bracketed them together. And this arrow tells me I'm, I'm fully consummating this. I'm going to resolve the dominant chord to the one chord. So I'll close with that as far as the analysis goes, but I would challenge you to print those three sheets. One, uh, one of those sheets, the one with the lead sheet uh, that's labeled lead sheet, has all the answers. So you can look at all the answers, but I challenge you to like take the grand staff one that has none of it done and find a D minor chord, find a minor seven chord followed by a dominant seven chord. Chances are, in this case, it is the case. That's the two five progression, bracket those. If you leave a G seven and it goes to a C major, if you leave a dominant chord and it goes to the major seven chord where it's expected to go, put that arrow. Not all G sevens in this piece go to C major, so be careful. Some of them go back to D minor seven. So you would not use the arrow there. The answers are there, um, and so I would challenge you to, to uh, 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 take a peek at that. I guess that's it here. I'm excited to play the song. We need to get down to playing, so stay tuned. I'll continue on with playing after this. All right, let's play. Prior to playing the piece, I would invite you to take a peek at the smooth voice leading attachment that's here, smooth voice leading. This is a key to the three chords that I use in the entire piece of music that's the basis of this lecture. So it's worth taking two minutes and just learning about smooth voice leading. It sounds very uh, hard and difficult and it really is not. It's actually very uh, easy and makes a lot of sense. Here's the thing. If we have three chords, you and I were playing a one chord, a two chord, and a five chord. Here's the one, here's the two, and here's the five. We can play them in root position. We can play them just like that, either hand. It's not that big of a deal, but it's not the most efficient way to get from one chord to the next, especially from one to five. Notice. This is the one chord. I actually have to lift up and go way up here to be able to play that five chord. But there's a strategy and it's so simple called smooth voice leading that uh, allows us to um, make more efficient choices, I guess is the way to put it. And the strategy is this, or the, the, the way in which to achieve that is this, is to find the common tones between two chords and keep them. Don't move them. Only move the tones that need to be moved. Let's look from the two chord to the five chord. <clears throat> Here's D minor seven, there's two. Here's five. I'll do the two chord with my left hand. There's D minor seven. Here's G seven. What are the two tones they have in common? Well, looks like they have a D and an F. So if I keep the D and the F, and I simply move these two tones here down to the G and the B, I can actually achieve that G7 chord. Same notes, different order, it's a different inversion, but it's the same notes. So this is a heck of a lot easier to have D minor seven going to G7. I didn't even have to look down. So that's what I'd encourage you to do. If you look in, in that, on that attachment, on the second line, you'll find a D minor seven chord and you'll see the D and the F are colored in. They're showing you that those two tones are the same two tones uh, are found also in the G7 chord. They have a different function on the G7 chord, but there is a D and an F in the G7 chord. Very easy. Let's get from the five chord to the one chord using the same game. Here's that five chord I was using, right? This is a G7 in second inversion. And I'm trying to get to a C major chord, C major seven. Let's see, keep the common tones. They have a G, they have a B, and move the others. The D and the F go down a step. 
voila. So I'll button this up. I don't mean to belabor the point, but smooth voice leading is your friend. It's our friend. <laughs> it's really a very useful and efficient way of playing chords. Um, and especially for practitioners like pianists, if we really embrace those, we don't even have to look down. If you're a writer, if you're an arranger, you may want to be aware of smooth voice leading as well for other uh, purposes. Just a much more efficient and mellifluous sound to the ear. You can hear all those inner lines. Anyway, there you have it. I'll button that up. Smooth voice leading, using common tones, and voice leading the others. Let's play this piece of music. So here we are, the most fun part. We're playing. We get to play the music. Let's apply that stuff that we had talked about earlier in the lecture, the analysis, and the derivation of the two and the five and the one chord and the little theory lessons behind it. Let's put that stuff to work so we can really enjoy it and really enjoy playing with that sort of, with those tools sort of under our belt. Three points I want to make before diving in. One, when we play the chords, let's remind ourselves to use smooth voice leading. I've got D minor seven smoothly voice leads to G seven by using the common tones smoothly, voice leads to C major seven. There's one, um, not caveat, but one tangent, one addition that I want to make. That is a, a D minor seven going to G seven. And instead of going to C major seven, there are a couple of instances in this song where the resolution is C major six. Not a big deal, super easy. There's a C major triad. Instead of adding the seven, I've added the six. And I'll just briefly, briefly mention that uh, the reason being is uh, over time, uh, many, not all the time, but many musicians favor if the melody is one, if the melody is the root, if the melody is tonic, and we're decorating, we're supporting, we're, we're harmonically uh, fleshing out that melodic tone with the one chord, that chord tends to be a major six chord, not a major seven. And you hear the difference. There's major six, there's major seven. They're both pretty. Major seven just has that extra kind of rub, that extra little spice of having that minor second in there. So that's the second point. I will favor using major six when we play um, those two spots in the song, the end of the second A section and the end of the last A section, where the melody is C, the chord uh, to decorate it will be C major six. The third point I want to make, and I only sort of touch on this uh, briefly because this is also the subject of another lecture, which is uh, uh, deals specifically with improvisation, but I'm going to encourage you to improvise. Here we are improvising in the jazz idiom, but if you're a rocker or if you're a metalhead or if you like to play country and western or you're a classical player, it doesn't matter. The genre is the genre is the genre, but these, this skill can really be applied. Here's some general observations that I would encourage you to embrace. That is, when we are improvising, make sure you're using the entire scale and the range of your instrument. In this case, we have a gigantic range for piano, but if you're playing alto saxophone or if you're singing or you're playing guitar, use the entire range to explore, to explore all of the highs and the lows and the mids of that instrument. Remember that little lesson that we had if we had the two and the five and the one and we crammed them all together, you're getting the C major scale. So whether you're playing D minor seven, G seven, or C major seven, or C major six, it doesn't matter. We can, as long as, long as we use that um, C major scale, 
uh, in its entirety, really. And then just trust our ears. Trust our ears, and that's where we'll get our taste from. That's where we'll get our phrasing from. That's where we'll get our sort of style from here. All right, five basic steps. Here we go. First step, right hand plays only the melody. Right hand plays only the melody. It's the given melody of the song. Second step, left hand plays only the chords, only the chords that are in the song. Third step, right hand plays melody, left hand plays chords at the same time. Fourth step, we exercise just improvisation, only improvisation with the right hand. Uh, and the fifth step is to add the chords with our left hand into that improvisation. So five basic steps, and at the end, voila, we throw this whole thing together, and you and I play this, we perform it in a traditional, typical jazz fashion, which I call the sandwich approach. This is two pieces of bread, and then whatever you like in the middle of the sandwich. Ham and Swiss, peanut butter and jelly, Whatever, whatever the case may be. So the first piece of bread and the last piece of bread are the head. They are the melody. They're the given melody, the, the, the melody that I've written. Those 32 measures, these 32 measures. And in the middle is our improvisation, also using those 32 measures. So if you will, we are going to play three complete forms. Head, solo, head. 32 measures, 32 measures, 32 measures. Each of those experiences is going to be this typical AABA experience. So here we go. Put on your boots.